Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ned Bosworth. She is a physician. She has been, uh, I had a pleasure meeting her, gosh, where was it, last year at uh, uh, Nebraska, yeah, last January in Omaha, that's right, yeah, so it was fun to, fun to get to talk to you and meet you, and so you've been uh, pioneering, championing ketogenic low-carb stuff for quite a while now, and you've got a book called Any Way You Can, and it talks about your journey with your with your mom and you know and, and dealing with cancer in that way and it's it's quite a uh, good resource for people that might have something similar it's kind of interesting my my father is uh currently in the hospital with uh presumably uh, advanced lung cancer we don't know we don't, we, we're still waiting on biopsy results and uh that sort of stuff so it's kind of interesting and so i maybe i can convince him to shift over to something like that. But anyway, uh, Dr. Boz, if, if you don't mind, would you go give us a little background on a little background history on you? Oh, yes, uh, we can. We can go back a long ways, but let's keep it uh, to the punchlines. I am internal medicine physician and uh, born and raised in South Dakota, fifth generation prairie girl. And when people ask me, why did you become a doctor? I tell them I hated hog chores and my dad prayed for a boy and hog chores were definitely in the future if I didn't find a much better path. So the um, schooling uh, in, in my, I grew up in a town of 800 people, K through 12 had 21 kids in it and uh, heading off to college was a big adventure. Uh, the first one in my family to I see. I think she she seems to be frozen, or maybe it's on my end. Can can anybody thumbs up if you can still hear? Or is she frozen? She's frozen. Okay. Well, hopefully, uh, Dr. Bosworth, you are frozen on our end. I don't know if your connection. Maybe she's going to drop in and drop out. So anyway, so if she is, uh, hopefully we'll we'll get back in here. She is back. All right. Do I have to unmute her again? Let me. Let me see if I can find her. I'm mute. All right, Dr. Bosworth, you back there? We lost you for a second. Can you? You guys can hear me, okay? I assume. Yeah, I'm on good. Okay, I wonder where. If she's got an unstable internet connection, perhaps. Could be it. Well, anyway, today is Monday. Hopefully everyone is doing well. I've had a nice, uh, started my day with a nice four mile walk with the dogs. I'm here, I see you, I need unmuted. All right, well, let me try again. There we go, ask unmute. There we go. There we go. We got you. Sorry about that. Not sure what happened. Or maybe unstable. There, there's an ice storm happening outside the window. So everyone thing went blank. And gotcha. Like, oh, gotcha. Okay. So sorry, you were in the middle of talking about hog chores and you were, you were trying to, you didn't want to do hog chores. And so. Uh, yeah, that's how I became a doctor. I said, I am not doing this for the rest of my life. My dad prayed for a boy and uh, that meant you were going to be in charge of that. And Whew, that uh, definitely, uh, I had to find a different plan. That's a stinky way to do it. <laughs> so yeah. I am, uh, edu go ahead. I was going to say, there, and to my knowledge, there are no medical schools. Educated in, here. Are there medical schools in South Dakota? I don't think they had yeah, any. There right? are. There are. Oh, I didn't know. Yes, South sir. One. We do. We have. Uh, I had uh, my primary school. My school for, um, for growing up was in a little town of 800 people. So K through 12 had 21 kids in it. So college was this really big place called Vermilion, South Dakota, with 10,000 people in it, which is also where the medical school oh, is. Okay. And yeah, 50 students a year. Honestly, it's got some uh, unbelievable uh, delivery of primary care physicians, uh, cross-training in uh, quite a few disciplines. Obviously, you can't have a medical school without the specialists coming out in droves as well, but we are really proud of the fact that we do lots of primary care, um, which is the backbone of taking care of folks. So I, internal medicine is, I actually really was planning on being a pulmonologist and having intubated patients. They were very analytical and they had calculatable answers that 
didn't argue with you. <laughs> Um, at least you were around around a bed of people or you're around a, a patient in a bed and a team of people made decisions. And I love that. I love that collective thinking. And then um, I had a baby right before uh, they said, do you want a fellowship in pulmonology? And I said, geez, who's going to raise the baby? <laughs> so I chose internal medicine outpatient. And honestly, it gave me a great foundation in um, sleep and some of the more analytical side of internal medicine. And I've just made a great career of it. It's been very rewarding. I'm, I'm glad that's how it turned out. Well, it's good for you. It's good to enjoy, you know, get to enjoy what you do. Uh, you know, I, I made a very different decision for my medical. Side. <laughs> I decided to go hit things with a hammer and, you know, and saw things, but, uh, you know, as an orthopedist, uh, and I enjoyed, I actually enjoyed the analytical. I enjoyed the physiology. I really did. I really enjoyed that stuff, but I just, you know, I don't know. I just, I guess I had that personality to want to, want to do the more surgical side of things. And uh, ultimately now I'm kind of doing the primary care, basically stuff, you know. Kind of yes, you are. Long <laughs> I'm telling you. There. But, but, and it's been fun. It's actually been very, well. I think the, the difference is when I was, you know, when I went to medical school, you know, I should say, and I, I basically started in the late eighties and then I left to go play sports. Cause I was like, I'm just gonna play sports. And then I restarted again in the early nineties. And, uh, it was just primary care didn't, it lacked appeal because I, I never saw anybody get better. You know, I, I saw a lot of frustration and blaming oh. the patients and, you know, that was my perception, you know, it was just like, we've just got these patients that, you know, all you do is give them new medications and they never get better. And, you know, it's, it's just like this continuous thing where as a, as a, as an orthopedic guy, I could get somebody with a broken arm, I could plate it or put a rod in, in a femur and the, I fixed them and they're good to go. And then I found out that over time, 85% of what I was seeing was just chronic disease in the form of arthritis or carpal tunnel syndrome or tendonitis. Mm -hmm. And, that, and, and it's just all the same thing that we, we all see in every specialty, but that's kind of- Oh, honestly, it's real. Like when I was choosing a, a practice, uh, you know, I, I thought this was a great uh, accomplishment to get to medical school and I was just loving the intensity of it. And then they ask you to pick a specialty. And of course I have a few role models in my life, but they're all primary care physicians. And I just, uh, I got to this core place where I said, I really want to be able to answer the questions my parents keep asking me. So, you know, dive deep is uh, the, I, I like, pe internal medicine has a terrible public relations team. Uh, what does it mean to be an internal medicine physician? Uh, so I tell them if, if you have a problem and an internist can't figure it out, you're going to die. Because you got to solve the problems. They're usually complex. It's usually multi-organ. And honestly, uh, when I look at the transition that's happened to my career uh, since 2018, probably, I have a, a personal goal that the, I mean, I could probably say, I don't know if I can say millions, but I could probably say the hundreds of thousands of prescriptions that I wrote in the first 20 years of my career it's my goal to stop that many doing what I'm doing now, because you're right. I have a prescription for every complaint. And if you want to see the way doctors get paid today, it is, did they follow the algorithm that's out there written by the colleges that uh, I have a perfect example of a gal who left the hospital this past week with a um, significant risk for a heart attack. She did have a, a heart attack, had a stent plate in placed when it was properly needed, which is during chest pain, a stent was placed. That's when it's supposed to be placed. But she left the hospital with a PPI, um, and with a, a proton pump inhibitor uh, suppressing acid. And she gets to the little keto support group that I run. And she's like, why did they prescribe this? And I'm like, oh, they don't get paid unless the, every little box is checked. You have a protocol and there's this thing called best practices in medicine. And it, it is really meant because there are so many things you have to be responsible for in medicine today that you can't possibly expect a 28 year old coming out of medical school, running the practice to know how do I manage all of it? So they've given them check boxes, which is great, but that's only 80% of the thinking folks. You got to keep thinking. And it's that 20% thinking that doesn't necessarily uh, happen. Uh, I mean, she got put on a proton pump inhibitor because that's what the best practices say to do. So there is a prescription for everything.
Yeah, I, I can remember some of the post-op protocols we had written for you know total knee total knee replacements, and I mean it was just it was it there wasn't any thinking. It was yes, put them on a PPI, yes, insulin sliding scale. Uh, you know, it was just all these things you put these people on routine. They wouldn't even think about it, and and it was just this kind of standard thing. And you're right, if you didn't if you didn't do it a certain way, you were either setting your yourself up for uh, potential uh, litigious issues, or something went went wrong, peer review. Or any of those things, and you know, like I said, a lot of these things, a lot of these things, like these PPIs, as you know, particularly if you go on them chronically, they they cause significant problems with a number of things. When did you when did you shift your focus into this sort of you know low carb sort of lifestyle based medicine, and what, and what what sort of sort of sent you that direction? So I again, I'm primary care, but I'm also I think being from a small community, there's this kind of hard wiring that says you have a community responsibility for the, for the job you're called to do. And so I had a ton of time spent in the shelters in my community as an internist, which is kind of weird. Uh, but there was a huge amount of mental health needs. And I am, I am, I do chronic disease management, like every internal medicine doctor, but I really enjoy the, the puzzles of what happens when your brain isn't working right. So there's a lot of, if you had a, a, a tapestry of the types of patients that come to see me, it is, they have a brain that's not working right. And whether that's Parkinson's or Alzheimer's or depression or sleep problems, um, that, that woe into eventually you're going to kind of swim upstream to addiction uh, medicine. So I had a bunch of addiction medicine that I don't um, do um, in a big public way, but I am definitely about getting people off of their drugs and uh, getting their brain healed. And that protocol has been something I've been studying for a long time. So there was a podcast in 2014 uh, by Tim Ferriss and um, uh, Dom Diagostino, and they were talking about some of the uh, protocols that the Department of Defense had kept them a national security secret for as long as they could. And, and then there was a point where there was a reveal of what the data was saying. And that's what uh, Dom Diagostino was talking about, saying there's this uh, higher understanding of how to repair a brain through a state of ketosis. And I'll be honest, I'm like, okay, Tim Ferriss has some weird things on his podcast, but that was blowing my mind. Like, what? Why don't I know about this? Maybe this is uh, like a... a I have a friend who's a doctor of the flute, the, the instrument. I'm like, is this guy a doctor of a flute? <laughs> you know, what kind of doctor is this guy? So I get online and I start looking and I'm like, oh, they're legit. And that uh, led me to read the papers on um, when you have a Navy SEAL, which is a very valuable human being, but uh, he is a weapon of human performance. Um, when they have an injury, especially in their brain, how do you heal it? And what I, in my clinic, doing some very advanced things like um, TMS and really working to make sure sleep protocols were depth of sleep to repair a brain, not just I'm sleeping, um, in air quotes there for people not watching, uh, the true repair of a brain was um, in this constant state of ketosis that they were calculating and measuring it blew my mind. It would take me at least five years to get the kind of outcomes they were getting in six months. So I, I actually closed the clinic for three days, which I'm a independent physician. If I'm not working, there's no money coming in. And that's kind of a, that's a lift. And in primary care, we don't have a, something to hammer or, or crack open. So we don't get paid the big bucks for procedures. We get paid for thinking. So you close the clinic as a primary, as the primary physician, you're going to lose some money, but I didn't care. I couldn't stand not knowing this. Went to the school library, the medical school library here in town and uh, just went nuts uh, for about 10 hours to home. <laughs> Three days later, I kind of come out of the paper mess and say, okay, I've got to be doing this. So I had, um, I first wasn't going to advise anybody how to do this until I did it myself. And I was there was no good handbooks out there. There was a lot of geeky stuff out there about how to do this in a protocol way, in the way that uh, you know MD Anderson was doing for their brain cancer patients, that the Navy SEALs were doing for any concussions, that some of the major NFL um, you know personalized coaches for metabolism and and you know body machine repair. There was a me method they were doing, but it wasn't like clearly written out anywhere. So I said, I'm going to do this on me. 
oh my gosh, three weeks later, I still hadn't peed a ketone. I'm like, what the heck is the matter here? And it was Memorial Day of um, 2015. And our city has a, about a 26 mile um, uh, river walk or a bike path. And my kids and I got up and at five o'clock in the morning, went on a 26 mile walk with a group of other people with rucks on our back uh, to represent uh, those fallen heroes who die from mental health or addiction that are soldiers. So it turns out if I walk 26 miles, I pee ketones, which was the first ketone I peed. And then, um, a month, so then I'm continuing to read. I've really, if you've never looked at the website from Pet Sanctuary uh, and pet being for dogs, but also pet is for pet scans. And you're in California, right? Yeah, I'm in uh, Southern California. Yeah, so uh, the Pet Sanctuary first started out in your state, but apparently the rules were too... Uh, they, they didn't protect animals well enough. So they moved them to Texas. So, so they're now in Texas, but the rules were within 50 miles of that uh, pet sanctuary. Any veterinarian who got the call that um, they wanted to euthanize their dog due to cancer, they asked if they would donate it to the pet sanctuary and they would put these dogs in a strict ketogenic diet. They would run the protocol that was being run in many of these hospitals and they would put them in hyperbaric oxygen chambers at night and these dogs were having incredible responses. I mean, they would have tumor lysis syndrome, which means so many cancer cells died at once that they plugged up their kidneys and died. And um, as, a, as it turns out, that um, was a good problem to have when you're trying to fight cancer. We can, we can back it off and not quite kill them so fast, but that process was something I had just barely read about um, when my mom, who at the time was 71 years old, and I'm still doing normal internal medicine here. Life is still status quo. I'm kind of working this keto thing in the background in my own personal life, but I haven't really talked about it much to anybody. And my mom uh, has had CLL or cancer over white blood cells for over 10 years at this point. She's had chemo a couple of times. During that time, she's put on like 70 pounds. She's only 5'3", so there's not room for an extra 70 pounds. Uh, she's got some pretty big lymph nodes uh, happening, and she doesn't feel well. She's been on antibiotics for 50 of the 52 weeks. And we walk into the oncologist's office, and I go to all of her appointments with her. She gets the best healthcare medicine could give you in the 21st century in a you know uh, Western um, city. And right before the oncologist walks in, she says, honey, if the report comes back as cancer, I need you to know that the clothes I want at my funeral are on the top sh shelf in the closet in the basement. And of course, in walks the doctor. I don't get any time to say what. Uh, and the report came back as cancer and we walked out of there with our pink slip to go get chemotherapy. And we're at a choice point in the hallway where one hallway leads to scheduling that appointment. The other one's the front door. And by now I've had about four months of just really looking at what the advanced teams are doing with the ketogenic journey. And I said, mom, do you trust me? And she kind of flippantly says, oh, of course I trust you. And she knows there's a confrontational conversation coming because the last thing she said to me was, I want to wear the clothes of you know, for my funeral on the top shelf in the basement. And I said, no, 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 no. Do you, tr do you really trust me with your whole life? And she said with a little emotion, I do. And I said, let's go out the front door. Let me show you what I would do. And we drove out. My farm's a hundred miles away from that little city, uh, that city or that hospital. We drove to a um, to the house. We <laughs> cleaned out all the carbs. We did what I do with my patients now, which is a carb cleanse. Uh, you get everything out of the temptation zone. I do much of the approach for what I would use with other addictions like heroin or alcohol or crystal meth, you know, any of those addiction processes we've been using in the past. We did a cleanse. We got her, and I don't mean like a bunch of nutraceuticals that you poop into the toilet. I mean, your house environment has no carbohydrates in it. And for the next six weeks, we did a, we did a sloppy version, a very chemically correct, but there was a lot of things we did wrong in that first uh, session. And um, 
you might not know, but CLL is measured by how quickly it doubles. When she was first diagnosed, those white blood cells went from like 40,000 to 80,000 over a four year period. Then it's a two year period. Then it's about a one year period. And when it's doubling every six weeks, you have a six month life expectancy. So she was doubling every six weeks at the point um, that uh, we got that net bad report. And her follow-up appointment was in six weeks. And like most busy clinics, the clinic didn't notice that she didn't come for chemotherapy. They just expect you to do that. Um, so she comes back in six weeks later and we get her numbers checked right before the doctor comes in. And um, she was like at 150,000 white blood cell count by this point. And the, it takes us a long time for the doctor to come in. Like, I know something's going on. And before we walked in, I said, mom, just don't tell them what we're doing. I don't have this. I don't have the, uh, like the, the mental fortitude to convince my colleague about this. Uh, so if he says anything, just shut up. Don't say anything. And in walks the doctor and he goes, I had to have your blood run twice because I can't see that you came in for chemo. Did you come in for chemo? And in my mind, I was just hoping it hadn't doubled in those six weeks. I hope like maybe it increased by 50%. Um, but he puts down the piece of paper and the cancer had reduced by 30% with six weeks of a ketogenic journey, screwing up a lot of things. I mean, we were chemically in ketosis, but we screwed up a lot of things. Um, and of course my heart's just racing going, I'm taking this really huge risk with my mother. And, um, and that's really when I started saying, I can't keep seeing patients like this. I can't keep prescribing these drugs and doing this, um, without, with a conscious, I've got to find a way to get this into my practice. So that was step one. The book is all about her journey. What happens from that, you know, that initial conversation and then two years later and it was, um, and then she got even healthier after that. So uh, the story has uh, just, I self published it. I, I, I'd never written a book before. I didn't plan on writing a book, but I, wanted it written down for my mom is really what I was doing. I had these little sticky notes of the lessons I had taught her. And so I did Amazon uh, self-publishing, push published. I think it sold like 70,000 copies. And um, the audio book is me reading it. And it's very um, interesting how well that turned out. And it's really helped people. Like um, I believe I've treated more patients in, what is it now? Three years of speaking keto and the science behind how to do keto than I did in 20 years of one at a time internal medicine, pulling your hair out. We're going to do labs every six months, three to six months and think I'm going to change your behavior. It's just, that isn't how it works. Yeah. And there, well, and there's a lot of things we can, we can discuss here, but um, I wonder, you know, I just, just, just for, I guess, for the people that may be new to ketogenic diets or, you know, meat-based diets or whatever, you said you did a lot of things incorrectly at the beginning. What were, what were those things and how have you evolved that over the, over the course of time? Well, let's just start with the things we did right. So again, this is all based on the protocols that were being run throughout the, the, the world, if you would, uh, but just in these little pockets of hyper um, early adapters, but they were pretty impressive. Like MD Anderson's uh, glioblastoma protocol is one of them that I studied very intensely, uh, even called the people saying, I need to know what you're doing. And of course, they're super nervous to talk about it at this point. Uh, they don't have great data behind them. They don't want to be peer reviewed. Uh, so I get what's happening to them, but they were adamant that saying they have to be in a state of ketosis. They have to be in a state of ketosis. Uh, Thomas Seafried was also somebody who was willing to pick up the phone with a physician and really taught me the power of how important it was to be calculating um, their, the ketones. And at that point, I didn't have a blood meter. We just did urine, but we did it every day and we were accountable to one another. We did a, some of the things that I, I just really think are the core if you're going to change somebody's behavior. And I'm telling you, chronic disease management is what I do. If you're going to change it, you got to have a tribe of people helping you. So the things we did right is we had a tribe, each other and we slowly added people to our tribe um, and we measured ketones. The things <laughs> we didn't do so well is, oh, we had tons of sugar substitutes. We had tons of, um, I mean, we just went, you, I mean, I, I really, I'm going to be careful here because if there are newbies out there, uh, there's a really critical point when I am uh, um, setting people up for success that says, I don't want you to look at anything 
but carbs for those first six weeks. And I mean, I don't want you counting calories. I don't want you counting fat. Um, I need you measuring ketones and I need you counting carbs and that's it. Um, and so, but we did that probably much longer than we needed to. We just had so much fat <laughs> and we really played a lot with the sugar substitutes. We weren't really re ready to give up all the sweet things that we had been eating. And um, it's kind of like asking my alcoholics to drink Odul's beer. Like they're still has, they have a process that they're not really addressing. Why are you eating that sugar when you're not, you, there's no hunger. You're just this habit that's there. And so by, by things wrong, I just meant there, there is a lot of things that happen in the first two months of a ketogenic diet that I can tell you if they're on the path for success or if they're about to you know, hiccup and relapse and do a bunch of sputtering. And a lot of it has to do with how, how willing are they to like, look in the mirror saying, why, why are you eating at 830 at night? So those are those wrong things were behavioral mainly, mainly. Yeah. I think you, you made the point of like the traditional medicine and, it, and it's really, I mean, the way the system's set up, it's just not possible for, well, I mean, with, with rare exception, it's not possible to get real live day-to-day, everyday feedback, maybe even every few hours, you know, like when you are really trying to change something, you know, and I, I can see if you measure, well, you're, you're a big fan of the glucose ketone index. And can you talk about yes. the utility of that and how that, I mean, I guess, particularly with, with cancer, but for any other conditions, does it have any utility in other conditions as well? Oh, absolutely. So the, I'll tell you the cancer part isn't so much um, what I uh, focus on. That's what my mother had. And it is a compelling story. Um, but when I pushed publish on that book, uh, the word ketone was really yucky. And so I was trying not to have a title with ketones in it. I mean, like now any <laughs> advisor of publications would say, put the word ketone at the top, even if you're not talking about it. Uh, but I really wanted the story of saying, here's this 71 year old who I'm a, I've got brains in the background of what I'm doing, right? So I would call her zombie phase um, of a patient status. Like when somebody comes in and they've been, they'd use marijuana, then crystal meth, their brain is just a mess. Uh, and we've got 15 years of this to unwind. They would be the zombie phase where the protocol is so intense to repair their brain. I need a chaperone running their stuff. Um, my mother was like that at 71, not from addiction, but because she was overweight. She, her brain was swollen. Her cancer medicines um, were... Her cancer was not doing well, but the medicines when they were used in the past had left scars in her brain. So um, when you look at the, the ketone index, um, and this, this data is very um, uh, apropos that in 2016 is when the Nobel Peace Prize or Nobel Prize in Medicine went to uh, um, the science behind how does autophagy actually work? And that autophagy is calculatable. I mean, to predict whether, and so do you think your audience knows what autophagy is? Yeah, most of them. So autophagy is what is needed in a cancer patient to repair when the cancer is reversing. Autophagy is what's needed in a rheumatoid arthritis patient when their joints have been swollen for 15 years. And we're not going to send them to the orthopedic surgeon. We want them to repair that and to chemically predict, are you on the path for repairing that? Or are you inflaming? You can measure that with a high level of prediction. And that is um, GKI is glucose ketone index, but remember my mom had a zombie brain. She wasn't thinking very well. And I would contend that many patients that I take care of with chronic illnesses, they have brains that that aren't working right. So she couldn't do the, you know, milligrams to deciliters, uh, you know, millimoles to liters. She, that was too much math. And so I said, okay, mom, just take the glucose and divide by the ketones. And in the background, I just did the math to say, all right, if you get a number that's below 80, you are, you are, you got a pretty good chance of autophagy. Um, you would definitely lose weight if you're, uh, I called, I didn't call it this, but it's become called the Dr. Boz ratio, which is you ignore the math. You just take the glucose, you know, the big number, divide by the little number, and especially for foggy brains that does work. Um, and if they would get a number of 80 or less, they were in weight loss zone. Boom. They're there. But if I could get, if I was trying to repair an immune system, which is, 
Um, you could say the CLL was part of that, but I, she's even more advanced than that. So repairing immune systems are my, probably the crux of where I get most of the, uh, um, patients who need a physician to help with this. And that is autoimmune problems where your immune system has gone wonky. It is not attacking a foreign invader anymore. It's attacking your own body and it is a mismatch. It is a, it is a cytokine crisscross. It's not supposed to do that. And to get a healthy crop of uh, white blood cells, I can do that. If you give me a perfect chemistry for 48 hours, we can start to see the new white blood cells. And they don't make the mistakes uh, as frequently or as intensely as the last crop. And you make 5,000 crops of that over the next six months, and we can really get uh, a tra transition in the amount of immune modulators that we need for those autoimmune disorders. Um, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis are some of the best stories I have for, these are absolutely destructive processes of the gut where your immune system is attacking itself. And if we want to do that, we, you have to calculate your chemistry. You cannot just play with this and get good outcomes. You, you gotta be in a tribe and you gotta calculate your outcomes. And that, um, is at least a Dr. Boz ratio of 40 or less. So that would be a glucose ketone index of two to one. Um, if you go to MD Anderson and you go to those protocols that were for brain tumors um, or Dr. Seafried's team who really works intensely with hyperbaric oxygen and um, the cancer protocols, um, they're a glucose ketone index of one to one, and that would be a Dr. Boz ratio of 20 or less. And again, this is not wonky. The, the math is a little wonky because you're not taking the and doing the proper algebra to you know get the units to match, but. Um, it is still the same goal. It's your chemistry inside is getting to this level where it says, if you want the best outcomes, we can measure it. Um, I've been taking people off of heroin and, uh, you know, serious addictions for 20 years. I'm telling you, this is what my, you know, my next, you know, that's what I've been working on for the last year is, um, since the book came out, I've really honed in the protocol. Like, what is it that I do? Um, and truthfully, you don't need to be a doctor to do this. I mean, you really don't need to be a doctor to do this. There's some things you should watch out for, but you should just educate yourself and take the information to your doctor because there's no way you're going to find people geeking out about this like, like you and I are. I mean, you can't be in medicine and do it. Like, I'm an independent physician. I still have a medical board that has to, you know, I have to practice, you know, evidence-based medicine, but... Um, as soon as you're on a hospital board or an insurance panel, or um, you're a part of a, a, a the first thing they're going to do is take you in front of a peer review and say, but Dr. Bosworth, you didn't put her on an acid suppressing pill after she got discharged from the hospital for her heart attack. That is against protocol. And everybody else that that is an internal medicine physician does that. So to take it all the way to say, I'm going to get you off your meds. We're going to do this in six months. And you need to show up for the free support group every Friday. Okay. No insurance pays for that. Okay. It does, it's, I don't even, I, it's free in my community. I lead it for free every Friday because the headache of trying to charge for it is I'm not interested in it. I am interested in how much better they get. And, and that's how my mom got to the point where um, she reversed age by she, she's the healthiest. She was the healthiest. She has been probably in her whole life uh, at 76. Yeah, let me just ask you because, and you said you've been refining that protocol. And I see on your on your uh, social media, you're constantly posting. You know, you've done this and that, and this is erasure. So, what are you finding? Um, I mean, obviously, diet plays a role, but I see you, you, you fasting, sauna. I mean, I suppose maybe exercise would come into play. What are you finding? Are the things that impact it one way or the other? Right. Well, the other let's address exercise because I think that's a misconception. Um, I have um, I have found that especially when I'm changing behavior, okay, again, this is a really, this really is an addiction and to unpack and think that food isn't how you comfort yourself. I just need you to look at a functional MRI when you eat bread. <laughs> it just lights up people. Uh, it's addictive. And that process, um, I want you addressing behavior for six weeks. Like I don't let them start exercise until they are, there's a, a keto continuum that I follow where it's, you know, kind of works through and, um, uh, I could share it with you if you want me to put that on the thing. Um, uh, on the chat or whatever. Yeah, you can, keto can, you can share your screen if you want to do that. And we can if okay. you talk behind me, that. So I'll find it quick while I'm talking. Yeah. yeah the, the 
keto continuum has to do with the pro the steps that um, I think are um, you know by far the most important part. Here we go. Um, okay, so now I will share my screen. Let's see. Push here, share screen. Oh, got it. Share screen. And here we go. Okay, can you see that? Okay, so this is just the continuum that I've set up. And I, I like people to focus along that left side where it says beginner, baseline metabolism, and stressing metabolism. And I don't let people exercise until they get to baseline metabolism. And whatever rate that, that takes them, and especially, you know, chronic disease management, most of the audience that I take care of, they aren't, you know, I have, eight, I have three sons, uh, very athletic, 15, 18, and uh, almost 20. Uh, that's not the metabolisms we're working with in the clinic. We're working with, you know, 30-year-olds that act like they're 50. They're 100, pound, 100 pounds overweight. They've been that way for since their teenage years. Uh, so 30-year-olds, but mostly 40, 50, 60, 70-year-olds. And as you hone in those mitochondria, really improve that efficiency of energy, there's some stuff happening on the cellular level that I need you to not push this uh, and think you're going to you're going to lose weight. You lose weight in the kitchen, people. You do not lose weight in the gym. There is a huge part of this that's, um, if you want the best health, we're going to get to exercise, but you're going to fall right off this wagon if you take on all that on day one. So I do not let them talk about exercise uh, until we get, they are stable in one of those baseline metabolisms. Uh, and this protocol is what the, I, I am, I was hoping I would release the, the book by somewhere in July, but uh, I released an course that's the clip to videos uh, and the hand that will make up the book that still isn't published yet, um, but should be hopefully by the end, in the next month, um, which is this protocol. It's using another patient story to talk about how did we, you know, how do I use this protocol in my clinic? Where do people, where do people hurt themselves? I mean, I've had people try to do all this at once and they're on the floor. I'm like, you have atrial fibrillation. Um, what the heck were you thinking? You cannot do this. Uh, you can do the diet. You just can't zoom into this, uh, you know, baseline number metabolism 16-8 uh, tomorrow. You've got to step into this because there are all kinds of chemistry things changing, mainly the reversal of chronic inflammation at the cellular level, which changes blood pressure. It changes mentation. It changes the depth of your sleep. And, um, and I want them taking that advantage for that, but uh, not at the expense of exercising too quickly. So, uh, so your question was, uh, I can stop sharing that if you want, but that, I, or I could go through this. It's up, to, it's up to you. Well, you can maybe just hit the highlights. I mean, it's a progression okay. of fasting and, 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 and I see, you know, the different things in here, but uh, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah. I mean, I'll give a 30,000 overview of it. So um, I do think the beginner to, to getting them stable in the sense that uh, they don't need to have quite uh, the intensity um, is about uh, a four to six week process. I don't know if you can see that, that probably fourth column, four to six weeks is what it takes to get out of the beginner's phase. And beginners, I, I actually put every, eat every two to four hours. That's what the standard American diet really forces you to do by the time you get to me, a chronic, chronic inflammation. Um, we then lower those carbs to 20 or less. We do not play games. We do not have net carbs. We are total carbs less than 20. Um, they are very close to carnivore before they know it, but I don't, I don't shove that down their throat on the, on day one. Um, and then I wait, I wait for their metabolism and their, and their life to accidentally miss a meal, because what you're doing is you're really raising these fat based hormones in that stage and you're lowering inflammation, you're lowering the insulin. Um, as you watch, it happens every time. It's great. I grew, I do these groups every Friday. And when somebody says, Hey, I, I was working the other day and I got home at eight o'clock at night and I hadn't eaten yet. And I jump up and say, yes, that's exactly what happens when the chemistry is right for you to move to the next level, which is, and so what I see people do quite often is they look around saying the neighbor lost 20 pounds, 40 pounds, hundred pounds of ketogenic diet, and they drop down to 16, eight. 
And they did not replenish their fat-based hormones before they do this. And their noggin, their brain function does not get the benefit of a ketogenic journey. And they aren't going to sustain. They're going to fall off the wagon. They do not have the fat-based hormones to sustain a ketogenic journey. And they're not going to get the benefit. They're not going to be triggering autophagy. They're not going to have that skin reabsorb, uh, you know, the weight loss that really does hold the skin to the muscle. Um, they're going to have all of the same weight loss problems that uh, are plagued with a low calorie diet if they don't restore their, their, their hormone chemistry first. So that's really what this goes through. I don't even like them to prick their finger. You see that urine ketone strips are well, you don't have to use them till you get advanced. And that's the kind of patients where now you might need a doctor. Now you might need to talk to me, <laughs> but most of the world doesn't need to do this. And especially if you see where I'm going, um, people live in baseline metabolisms, which is either a 16, eight pattern, um, uh, or a advanced 16, eight is another mistake that my mom and I did for probably a year and a half is we had these really high fat coffees in the morning. And although that's very important at the beginning of a ketogenic journey, if you're looking to lose weight, we gotta, we gotta trim that up. We gotta take that out of your coffee in the morning and whatever calories you eat, uh, and I mean calories now, I don't talk calories before that point, uh, have to get contained in this section of time. Uh, so we usually have to clean up the morning drink or you got to start your timer at the time you start that drink. And then at the end of eight hours, you got to zip it shut, stop it, quit eating. Um, and so then we get to, you know, 23, which is, I don't like the word one meal a day. Cause I think OMAD got bastardized somewhere where people said, yeah, I have one meal a day, but I have the high fat coffee in the morning. And then I have some, you know, I have some, uh, ketogenic blah, blah, blah here. I'm saying all your calories go in one hour. So, um, and then again, we take it to an advanced 23 and me. That's the most advanced baseline metabolism. That's where people live. That's their life. Right. Um, and that is that their one hour of fasting happens closer to sunrise than it does sunset. And it never happens after dark. Uh, you have to match your circadian rhythm further. So you're trying to move that hour of eating earlier in the day. Again, start out with that. This is where I see lots of people fall on their face or hurt themselves as they, they're trying to follow rules that their metabolism is not ready for. But then most importantly is now you say, how do I stress a metabolism and how do I make it stronger? And yes, exercise would do that, but I'm talking, how do you do it with food? Uh, because a lot of my patients have a very low capacity for exercise until we get them healthier. So we've got to find a way over uh, this place they're stuck in. And so uh, we do 36 hour fasting um, and then 36 hour fasting without celebrating at the end, which is a trick of mental approach. Uh, then we do what I call... Um, OMAD squared, which is one meal every other day. And that actually fits in really well with a lot of people's uh, lifestyles. Um, and then finally, uh, the ultimate challenge is a 72 hour fast. And it's not just one 72 hour fast and you're done. You do that every week for eight weeks consecutively while posting some numbers that teach me how strong your mitochondria are. So that's the, that's the book that's coming out that's not done, but it, it is an online class that I go through that with. What is, uh, because, you know, who is this designed to treat, you know, to say, I'm going to do a 72 hour fast every week for, for eight weeks. Once I get there, who are we, who's our target audience for in this particular case? Yeah. So take, uh, let's just take an easy one to talk about without any HIPAA concerns is my mother. So here she was this past summer. Um, my dad had died of, uh, uh, uh in June of, of kidney failure that could have been prevented had I been a good enough daughter to teach him that 20 years ago, but I, I didn't know that. So he died. Uh, she was kind of grieving um, and she gets to her and she's doing keto. She's definitely, she checks in for the, she zooms in for the group meetings every week and she's checking in, but we get to her oncologist and in your bone marrow, there are three um, places, three things that grow, your white blood cells, your red blood cells, and your platelets. And so her white blood cell count, which is her cancer count, hasn't changed that much, but the red blood cells and the platelets were, were smaller and they'd been going down for the last three checks, which means the scar tissue left from the cancer was kind of taking over the real estate in her bone marrow. And so we really needed to trigger some autophagy. I'm like, mom, you're too old for a bone marrow transplant. They won't do that. You can't go in and scrape out the scar tissue. The only tool you have is autophagy. 
And I said, I know you haven't done the 72 hour uh, fast since we wrote the book or, you know, I, she'd done a few of them, but nothing like the protocol, the eight consecutive weeks. And I said, so we're going to challenge you. And again, we kind of recruit the online community to, um, you know, to support her and to support anybody else that's looking for this, especially uh, this is what I would have my autoimmune patients do. Um, it's what I'd have. Uh, especially a Crohn's patient that we're trying to cut down on prednisone again. We're trying, we're trying to get you in the right direction. Um, I need you stressing your metabolism. And again, you cannot do a 72 hour fast until you've been at one of those baseline metabolisms for a good six weeks. Like I need your hormones, your fat-based hormones really sustaining this journey. And I need the psychology of you on board with this. So, um, so when I took her, you know, her bone marrow uh, numbers were, you know, just showing scar tissue. So how can we ignite? How can we measure autophagy for that reabsorption of the scar tissue in her bone marrow? We can push her Dr. Oz ratio under 20 and we can hold it there uh, for those 72 hour fasts. And then when she wasn't fasting, she was still eating, you know, one hour of calories per day. It was a really hearty meal, very satisfying meal, mostly I'm a hog farmer and dog and, and pig farmer's daughter. So there's plenty of uh, great meat around. And um, if she had some struggles in the middle, uh, she would have a little bone broth made from actual bones, not just broth with brown and salt in it, really bone marrow. So, uh, so her, she did amazing. She was in an uh, incredible health. So, but so who, who is the target for is anybody who's struggling with taking uh, their health to the next level. They're trying to get off uh, that, cholesterol medicine. They're trying to get off a of blood pressure medicine. They're trying to lose the next 15 pounds. Uh, I need you to stimulate the mitochondria. And you can say, well, can't you do that with exercise? Yes, you can. Uh, but I think there is a place for uh, pushing your mitochondria due to a different stress. Uh, so heat stress is your sauna stress. Exercise is a stress. And then uh, no calories is another metabolic stress. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk about hormesis. It's another another term you could use in metabolic stress and exercise, fasting, sauna, cold. All those things seem to have an impact on that. Let me ask you uh, two things. So somebody brought up the question about thyroid health. There's a lot of concern about fasting and carb restriction as being possibly deleterious to our thyroid function. How do you deal with people that are already on thyroid meds? Or does this seem to have a negative impact on thyroid function? How do you deal with that. And then the other thing is you may, well, I'll let you answer that and then I'll get back to the cholesterol question. All right. So have you ever met Peter Atia? The, uh, I think he's also in your region, but he's also a big. I've guy. not met him, but I'm familiar with him. Okay. So one of my favorite things he's done is he's tried to understand this, right? So he gets himself like all of us, we're kind of on the frontier and you think, you know, the answer to something, and then you do a self experiment. You're like, I don't know, but this did not turn out like I was planning. So watching his thyroid experiment of he does a weekly fat, a week long, seven day fast, um, four times a year, and he'll check his thyroid numbers at the beginning. And at the, you know, I think maybe even a couple times in that week, but at least at the end of the week and just watching what it, what your thyroid does in the setting of a fast is very instructional to answering that thyroid question. And that is, you shouldn't look at your thyroid numbers during a fast, but you shouldn't uh, think that, um, uh, hold on here, I have a battery issue that I need to fix. <laughs> my internet almost died. Okay, there we go. I'm on my phone so that they, we don't glitch out again. We're fixed. Uh, the, you shouldn't look at your thyroid numbers during or right after a fast. You, you have just asked the thyroid to do a couple of wonky things. And most physicians aren't going to know or understand, or even uh, even when we do understand it, we still can't quite sort out exactly what timing did we get this lab at relative to the last time you ate and the way you slept the night before. So when it comes to the data on thyroid, there are a few things that I can encourage people. And that is, I have a ton of people who were on low dose thyroid medication. Um, where I believe that the reason they had uh, hypothyroidism is a, an autoimmune process that was kind of eating up their thyroid hormone. Um, they still could produce it, but whatever they were being, what, what they were producing was kind of tearing it down faster than it could be used. And when they got healthy, we, we were able to take that thyroid and get them off of thyroid medication over the course of about 
I don't know, a year and a half into keto. Um, I think the other thing that I would give reassurance to that, um, so thyroid medication, um, let's speak specifically about Synthroid. Uh, it, it was originally designed to be a week long dose. Like you should take it on Monday and then next Monday, but humans don't do that very well. So we divided it up into daily doses. So the pill you take today, um, really is effective for a good, you know, the half-life is very long and that's of our own hormone, but also of the pill. So knowing that and, um, realizing that there is, there's a half-life involved with the assessment of thyroid processes that isn't very well talked about. It's in every physiology book, go to the library, open up the physiology book on thyroid. You'll see it. Um, but by the time you get 10 years into practice, you kind of forget that like, okay, I don't know. I, the weekly dose of thyroid divided by seven. Here's the closest dose. Here's what I prescribe. Why am I doing the weekly dose divided by seven? Oh yeah, that's right. The, the half-life lasts a long time, but you kind of forget the origin of why you do that. Uh, and, and then some people don't do that. They just kind of guess the next number. Um, the point I'm making is thyroid disease is wonky. It's not as, um, it, it is a minor part of your metabolism when it's way off. It's important, but when it's kind of off, it's not nearly as powerful as fueling your mitochondria with fat-based ketones. You're going to feel amazingly better when you figure that out. Uh, the thyroid will become this tiny little thing that is not, it becomes a lot of noise in patients' um, histories. Like it's my thyroid. It's my thyroid. It's my, your thyroid doesn't get that much responsibility. Okay. It's gets a little and it's important, but it's not everything. Yeah. Well, I'm just, there's just a question in there. And I, I think, you know, it's, well, one thing that I certainly say is there's, there is so much dynamic variability on so many of these tests we rely on. And most people just blindly to say, oh, it was low this day. And therefore you need, you need, you need uh, supplementation. Uh, Dana is asking about, you know, if you're going to get your thyroid tested, mm. you know, do you need to come off for a while? So you don't have this factitious suppression. Um, you know, it's, it's, Probably so would be my guess, but I, I I can't say I'm a thyroid expert with regard to that. Do you have any input on like saying if you no. want to see what, what is your thyroid doing so, in the absence of, of medication, you know, it would make sense. You Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I tell my patients, uh, so first of all, you're the blindly doing something based on a lab test. We need no better example than LDL cholesterol to make that point. If anybody's like, what do you mean by that? And that is what you know, even this generation of physicians coming out, you'd love to hear that they'd get a better understanding than we did. Uh, no, they're getting the same one that we did. Um, so hopefully we can change that tone. We can help educate patients, which will educate their physicians. I, I do think that's the only way we'll get any of the noise taken care of. When it comes to thyroid, you're going to start with checking a TSH. <clears throat> I know there's lots of reverse T3s and, you know, uh, T4s and T3s and, um, and that's lovely. And they do all have an equation in the, um, in the, in the algorithm of thinking. But the first one is what does your brain think? And if your brain, if the TSH, and that's what the brain sends to the thyroid says, huh, we're pretty good. All the, I mean, very rarely, I mean, very rarely do these other ones have this powerful change in how you feel. They'll have a little bit, but I contend that you get your, your immune uh, modulators right inside your body, which is an anti-inflammatory state, which is a state of ketosis for at least six months, you're going to feel a million times better and your thyroid is going to do what it's going to do and will adjust to what it's doing. When it comes to checking labs, I don't, I tell all of my patients, you should never check your labs right at the end of a 72 hour fast. All you're doing is confusing the doctor. Your triglycerides are going to be up. You're going to have some wonky things because your body's adapting. It's living without food. And your doctor is not used to seeing that. You're just going to end up on meds. So if you're doing one meal a day, fast overnight, get your labs drawn in the morning, uh, that's fine. <clears throat> Don't stop taking your thyroid medicines. If you do stop taking your thyroid medicine two to three days before your lab test, it doesn't do anything. You're testing last week's dose. So, Yeah, half-life is quite long. So let, let's just delve just for this remaining bit, bit of time we have left. Because you said you're getting people off or fixing people's cholesterol issues uh, with fasting. Can you go into more on that? Because we do know that, you know, I've seen studies where 72-hour or seven-day fast results in higher sometimes 
cholesterol. Sometimes it results in higher glucose. You know, I mean, it just depends on, you know, I, I guess what the body's, you know, trying to, trying to, to fix, you know, you've got this, I need energy somehow. So your body's going to make, so let talk about what you mean by that. And what, and, and, you know, obviously the traditional view is all LDL cholesterol is horrible. We need to minimize it as much as possible to prevent a heart attack. What are your, what are your thoughts on what your protocol does with cholesterol? And what do you mean by that? Yeah. So <clears throat> I do a lot of, uh, I have a, a YouTube video that was put out, I don't know, probably about six weeks ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. That talks about um, what what most physicians forgot to think about, and honestly, I'm sure someone taught me this in medical school, but I had to go back and relearn it because it must have been an answer on a test that I just said, okay, next 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 data dump. Here we go, uh, and that is that cholesterol uh, is recycled. It, it goes out of the liver, and then it's going to be these resources that it needs to go back into the liver. And that recycling process is the movement of cholesterol. Uh, the, the movement has everything to do with whether or not that cholesterol has been oxidized or not. And oxidation is might, might sound like a good thing, like, oh, we add oxygen to it. No, oxidation, think of it as rusting the cholesterol. It's not, uh, it is it is more charged in the, in the sense of particle destruction. And those cholesterols, those oxidized LDL cholesterols are where the naughty inflammatory heart attack risks come from. So level of cholesterol has everything to do with what your body's needs have been, where you, what you've been eating, the transition for where you're at. And I spent a lot of time focusing on this, but I'm telling you, uh, it, it is at least an hour long discussion when the patient comes in and the LDL cholesterol is over 200, I mean, not the total cholesterol, the LDL or 300. And I'm like, don't look at that. <laughs> we have other issues here. And I want to know what are your triglycerides? What are your HDL? I mean, we can do some advanced testing and get particle sizes of the cholesterol. There's a lot better ways to look at is cholesterol doing its job of delivering nutrients to the body the best resource for nutrients is a triglyceride and a fat. <clears throat> and if it's doing that, then uh, it's doing its job. But if insulin is too high, if you've got a state of high sugars and low ketones, which would be a Dr. Boz ratio greater than 100, you're not recycling your, your cholesterol. You're stuck. And that's where you're going to make a heart attack. So there are some things that you have your responsibility as a patient to check these things. <clears throat> and adjust your eating to get your first morning fasting numbers. Um, and again, people, I don't, they don't need to check every day, but when they're under maintenance of me saying, we're trying to get your cholesterol better, uh, it's not going to happen tomorrow. It takes us six months to do this. And in the process, you got to be checking three times a week. What is your morning fasting glucose with your morning fasting ketones? And when I can get that under a hundred, I am very confident that we are moving cholesterol. We are not stuck with this high inflammatory state. Um, so I don't know if that answers it, but so I'm just showing that there's a process and there's a whole bunch more going on behind the scenes than LDL. LDL cholesterol is just, I mean, it's a great test for 1969, 1970. It's really shouldn't be used today. So. Yeah, we've been, we've been, I guess we've been able to measure blood cholesterol for, I guess, around a hundred years and we're still debating on its utility and how to utilize it. And there's, there is so much more, but we do have a lot of doctors that are stuck in the 1980s, it seems like, and we've kind of, kind of moved on from that. Um, we've just went through a whole hour. This has been fascinating. I know the members have really enjoyed this. I'd love to get you back on down the road. We can continue this discussion, maybe if you're willing. Tell us where they can find, you know, your books, when the new book, what the title of the new book is going to be, when it's going to be out, how they can get a hold of it, and then how to follow you on social media or find you otherwise. Well, so my website is boz, B -O -Z -M -D com. And the, so you can find all the links from that website if you want. Um, my, the favorite thing that I do is Sunday nights. I do a live broadcast every Sunday night. Uh, I've usually talking about a patient story or uh, kind of giving some updates for what patients have written in over the, or people have written in for the last week. Um, the, the name of the book uh, is actually called Keto Continuum. And Again, I've had some setbacks over the last six, uh, so COVID's really been hard on me uh, for a host of reasons, but I'm hoping to have the push publish here in the next three weeks uh, on the book. 
and it will have a workbook. So the goal for the, the next book, and you'll see the any way you can books on in the store, on that online store. But this next book has uh, the story of the patient, but also a workbook for patients to work through the process on their own. Wonderful. And then, uh, well, I guess as far as uh, speaking, because I know I ran into you at a speaking, I don't know when that's going to start back up. If anybody's, everything's <laughs> doing virtual right now. And I don't know. I enjoy getting yeah. out and actually meeting the people and shaking their hand and hearing their story in, in live, but I don't know. Hopefully it's do real. Any, yeah. Do you have any idea? Have, that's good. Anything's going to come I, around for you? I haven't had anybody even ask me in the last four months. So I don't know. I, I had several gigs that were set up for this fall that all got canceled and then kind of just been quiet. Like the energy of putting those things on is a lot. It costs people a lot of money to do it. So to do it and then have everything shut down, I just think is too big of a risk for the vendors and the organizers. Yeah, unfortunately. All right. Well, and that, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. Uh, I really would like to get you back on maybe down the road, you know, if, if you're willing. So I yeah, think our community really absolutely. enjoyed it and good luck to you and stay safe up there in South Dakota. And hopefully things, you know, things go good for you now. And uh, you know, that type of stuff, but uh um, well, thanks for inviting me on. I really appreciate it. I I, uh, I get a few requests, but when yours came across, I'm like, oh, I would love to talk to him. That'd be great. So thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Well, you guys all have a great day. We'll see you back tomorrow. We got uh, uh, Gabe Brown, another part of, he's part of your, I don't know if you know Gabe Brown. He's a regenerative, regenerative agriculture guy. Uh, I think oh, he's yes, up in, I do know him. He's up in North Dakota, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, so he is. Yeah, he's so. my buddy. Yes. Anyway, he's coming on tomorrow. So you guys take care. We'll see you guys. See you guys in and I'm going to go eat some steak. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Ha, <laughs> ha,